afternoon, and uh, I want to welcome everyone to the opening ceremony of the 11th World Congress uh, of the International Society for Universal Dialogue. Uh, it's great to be back in Warsaw at this, this wonderful uh, institute. Uh, wonderful to see so many participants here in Warsaw for this important event. Uh, it's been great to see many familiar faces and to reconnect with old friends. Uh, but also, it's very encouraging to see so many new faces uh, here at the World Congress, and I very much look forward to our meetings and discussions over the course of the next few days. As many of our speakers today have stressed, uh, 2016 is the 27th anniversary of the founding of our society, which took place in Warsaw in November of 1989. So I think it's absolutely appropriate and fitting that we return to Warsaw on this occasion as Charles mentioned, as a homecoming celebration, but also as a time to reflect on our society, to consider and to possibly reconsider our guiding principles, our values, ideals, and to contemplate our future. At the time of the founding of our society in 1989, the social, political, and economic map of the world was undergoing a radical transformation. The old Soviet Union was collapsing, the Berlin Wall was tumbling, and the tendency of the European states was to cooperate more economically, politically, culturally, to form uh, an economic, geopolitical block of sorts. Moreover, it seemed to many, at least at the time, that serious steps were being taken by the great world powers to reduce the production and proliferation of nuclear weapons and to resolve regional conflicts and to address many social problems on the national and international levels by peaceful, by more peaceful and cooperative means. In general, there was a more optimistic sense that interconnection and cooperation among the states of the world, states which until only very recently had been only loosely related, uh, were becoming more of a way of life in the international sphere of the late 20th century. Against the backdrop of this world historical situation, the formation of our society at the time named the International Society for Universalism signified, at least in the minds of many, the emergence of a new philosophical consciousness. One committed first to the promotion of intercultural dialogue as the best means to help actualize the highest and richest human values in all dimensions of life. And secondly, to the promotion of a philosophical discourse aimed at the gradual emergence of a more decent, peaceful, and just world. It was hoped that this new philosophical world consciousness grounded in dialogue could step into the ideological vacuum of the time to provide some understanding and solutions to the many problems facing the contemporary mosaic of human societies, and to offer some practical insights into how to restructure some of the major world institutions to enhance the evolution of a more peaceful and just world, one based not in a Hobbesian state of nature, but in a more civilized state of transnational, intercultural dialogue, communication, and cooperation. Uh, regrettably, I was not in attendance at the founding event in Warsaw in November of 1989, but I did join the Society the following summer for the Second International Symposium of Universalism, which took place at the University of Berlin in August of 1990. And I did so at the suggestion of uh, one of our founding member and the second ISU president, uh, Michelle H. Midius, which Charles just mentioned, um, was a former undergraduate mentor of mine. Uh, at the time, I was a graduate student at Columbia University, but uh, Michelle had uh, invited me. And he explained to me that uh, the ISU was unlike other philosophical societies, and that it was not just focused on one particular area or problem in philosophy, or committed to a particular ideological philosophical outlook, but rather the ISU was committed first to a critical dialogical and cooperative search for meaning and shared values, as well as a holistic understanding of ourselves and the world we live in, a world of unity and diversity, identity and difference. Second, the ISU was practically oriented in that it did not view philosophical discourse merely as an intellectual luxury to be enjoyed by a small class of academic elites but as an instrument for the creation of a more decent human world, a world in which people can live according to the highest demands of the human spirit and its cultural, moral, religious, aesthetic, scientific, economic, and socio-political dimensions. 
A valid theoretical understanding of the world should be the basis for developing a world atmosphere in which we foster a lasting harmony and cooperation between the states and peoples of the world and also be the richness of cultural diversity. Thirdly, through critique, clarification, and what Charles Brown, I think, has uh, cleverly called the gentle and forgiving spirit of dialogue, the society seeks to articulate a conceptual framework which can be the basis for understanding the present world reality and the richness of its complexity and diversity, but also providing a suggested plan for restructuring, reordering the major relations and needs of the world states and peoples. Uh, one in which traditional power politics and intrigue is replaced by dialogue, a commitment to moral principles, and a concern for the well-being of other nations and other peoples. Well, the discussions in Berlin were dominated by an atmosphere of collegiality, understanding, and an enthusiasm for the historical significance of the time and the place. As you might expect, there was a lot of emphasis on the importance of East-West dialogue and of the need to construct an intellectual framework within which we can create the possibility of meaningful dialogue, East-West, North-South, and therefore the possibility of a better understanding between the diversity of cultures and philosophies. There was also much emphasis on the need for a new form of universalism, one that avoided the totalizing tendencies of the more traditional forms, which tended to swallow up cultural and philosophical differences, and which ensured both the continuity of the best of local, regional, and national cultures and traditions, as well as placement in much broader cultural context. The city of Berlin itself seemed to provide a, provide a particularly relevant expression of the society's efforts. Uh, for while parts of the Berlin Wall were still standing, symbols of a grim, fitful, and tragic past, there were also huge gaps in it, allowing the free mingling of diverse groups of people back and forth between the former eastern and western sectors of the city. And large numbers of visitors and residents were relentlessly chipping away at the wall with hammers and chisels. Uh, in general, the city exuded a very positive, upbeat atmosphere of tolerance, understanding, and open-mindedness, just the sort of value orientation our society is keen to promote. As Janusz Kaczynski said in his opening address for the First World Symposium, quote, our universalism is also an intellectual basis for a real tolerance and openness, and also a truly humanistic, kind-hearted understanding of others. Well, fast forward 15 years. On July 15, 2005, I stood uh, uh, before the Sixth World Congress of the now renamed International Society for Universal Dialogue as the society president, and I delivered the presidential address at our World Congress meeting at the, which took place at the University of Helsinki in Finland. Once again, global changes had occurred that were dramatically transforming the basic structure of international, transnational relations. Any remnants of the Berlin Wall had long been relegated to museums. The city of Berlin was now the capital of a unified Germany, which in turn was a prominent member of a vibrant European Union, an organically emerging transnational commonality committed to divided, limited sovereignty and the principle, principle of subsidiarity and rooted historically and structurally in the local, regional, and cultural interests and self-understanding of the various member states. Many hoped that the, that EU model might offer the world a regional glimpse of progress, at least, towards forging a more cooperative and peaceful world. Most significantly, globalization had asserted itself as a basic and probably permanent feature of the modern world. And while economic globalization, you know, undoubtedly contributing to lifting, lifting millions out of extreme poverty, poverty and bringing uh, education, health care, opportunities, development to parts of the world which had never before experienced such things, when I have to think about China and India over the past few decades, Nonetheless, it also posed a number of daunting and ominous challenges and problems for the future. Challenges which, as I suggested at the time, called for a radical rethinking of many of the basic ideals, values, and relations that define modern society. In particular, as society president, I urged the society to focus on three broad areas of concern. 
challenge or the problem of the physical sustainability of the natural world in the face of climate change, global warming, and increased ecological degradation, the challenge of promoting intercultural dialogue, recognition, and re reconciliation and peaceful coexistence in the face of escalating global violence and the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, and the challenge of promoting freedom, human rights, and justice in a world increasingly dominated both by extreme instances of economic inequalities and chronic poverty for masses of people, and the unchecked influence of multinational corporate forces and transnational elites. There was much serious discussion in Helsinki about the need to find creative structural solutions for breaking the current cycle of domination and economic, ecological, cultural destruction and oppressive anti-democratic, anti-ecological tendencies in order to build a more peaceful and just world through universal dialogue and cooperation. Well, almost 11 years later to the day, now in 2016, these and many other global problems and challenges have become all the more urgent and all the more pressing. In the wake of Brexit and other fiscal and political difficulties, the EU, and more generally, the post-war architectural structure that made Europe more stable and prosperous is under increased pressure. Ongoing conflicts in the Middle East, North Africa, and elsewhere have generated the worst refugee displaced person crisis that the world has experienced, since, certainly since the end of the Second World War, some would say ever. Moreover, there has been a general sense in Europe, in North America, and elsewhere that the economic dynamics of globalization has been focused far too much at the higher levels and has disproportionately shortchanged the least advantaged in societies, even in, in the more developed countries. And as a result, economic inequality between the top and bottom tenth of the human population is by some accounts a staggering 320 to 1. And the wealth inequality is nine times greater still. These enormous global inequalities between rich and poor, the global north and the global south, are increasing relentlessly. Along with the increase in global inequality is the accompanying increase in the power and influence of transnational corporations. For example, by 2009, of the world's largest economies, 56 were countries, but 44 were corporations. And this raises many issues concerning, the democratic, concerning democratic accountability beyond the corporate boardroom. Moreover, the dynamics of the current economic and corporate-driven globalization has been steadily undermining the role of the traditional nation state as an instrument of human well-being, converting the state by degrees into a subordinate relationship with global corporate and market forces. And as a result, many states, even those operating on a secure basis of legitimacy, are losing, or slowly losing their capacity to provide for the welfare, security, and economic and social well-being of their citizens on a territorial basis. In the wake of these and other factors, we have witnessed the rise in recent years of ethnic nationalism, sectarianism, protectionism, xenophobic fears, anti-immigrant concerns, religious fanaticism, and of course, global terrorism. Finally, some would argue that the current period of globalization has been the most environmentally destructive period of human history. And despite much discussion about climate change and global warming over the past few decades, few coordinated global measures have been implemented to address these issues. Political support has been weak and limited in most cases, and many governments and corporations still see measures to reduce carbon emissions as threats to economic growth and global competitiveness. In light of all of the above, we should ask the following. How can the states and peoples of the globe be pulled back from their current drift towards a market-driven, corporate-driven, anti-ecological globalism and led to manifest a greater degree of ref receptivity towards a more human-driven globalism, one that could underpin a more rational, humane, and decent governance for the planet. The challenges are huge, and the stakes are high. How best to proceed? 
Well, if I could paraphrase Immanuel Kant, the proper role of the philosopher should be to critique, to clarify, and to advise, to cast a ray of light when the leaders find themselves in the dark. Therefore, it is fitting that philosophers, social scientists, and other scholars who are committed to intercultural dialogue on these and the other great issues of our time should gather at this World Congress in Warsaw to explore the role of ideals and values across a wide spectrum of theoretical and practical issues, to investigate the role played by ideals and values in an increasingly global social and political life, as well as in the formation of personal and cultural identities, and in the natural and social sciences, in art, religion, as well as in moral reasoning and practice. The ISUD is committed to promoting a more decent, peaceful, and humane world. And as such, we will continue to look for new ideas and new sources of inspiration. We will continue to work to forge a more just international economic, legal, and political framework and to help implement a more rational and democratically oriented world governance. We will strive to promote discourse on the epistemic grounds of moral judgments and the ontological underpinnings, underpinnings of moral discourse, and we will continue to strive to show how we can have participation in the best of local, national, and regional cultures and traditions, as well as a sense of belonging and understanding with much broader historical, cultural, and social context, including perhaps a more cosmopolitan world culture and a shared life among the peoples of the world. Thank you.